I welcome you to Innovate. Yeah, this is where we innovate. This is the podcast where change is all made. If you're not growing, then you're dying. Innovation is the key to surviving. This is Innovate, where we scared to make that change and create a new way. Uh huh. If you're ready to learn and sit back and just chill, it's about to get real. This is Innovate. And welcome on into the Innovare podcast. We got a uh, another great show for you today. Today we're going to be uh, hitting pretty heavy on the business side of things. We're going to be talking about, well, talking about yourself and telling your own story. And we're also going to touch a little bit on Encore Careers, the other side of entrepreneurship. Uh, so oftentimes when we think of entrepreneurs, we think about uh, the young guys, the young startups out there in San Francisco being all whippersnapper. But let's work it today. We're going to talk a little bit about Encore Entrepreneurs, and, and we'll get into what that means and exactly what that is here with our next guest, who his name is Mark W. Halpert. He is a self-described multipreneur. Leaving the corporate finance world in 2001, Mark has started three companies, all of which still operate. In 2010, he started his third company, Connect to Collaborate, which is what most of our conversation will be about today, to spread his LinkedIn and networking evangelism to train and coach others. He offers professionals the opportunity to better explain their brand and positioning themselves on telling their story. Welcome on into the NFRA podcast, my man, Mark Halpert. How are we doing, buddy? We're great. We're ready to rock and roll and tell some good stories. That's right. That's right. So first off, I know that I lobbed this terrible, terrible joke in the pre-show, uh, but I wanted to do it again and just say, are you sure there is no connection to Mr. Jim and uh, Miss Pam Halpert? Yeah, that's a terrible joke. Um, <laughs> it's a terrible joke for my search engine optimization, which is the same response I gave you. Um, yeah. If you Google me, you'll find Jim Halpert all over the place. Jim does not exist. He is not a real person. I he can't might. tell how many people come up to me and say, how's Jim? Yeah. How are you related to him? And I'm not. So so uh, Jim Krasinski's doing fine uh, without me. So uh, that's the end of that story. Yeah. Are you sure he doesn't exist, though? We're yeah, positive. Can you touch him? Has uh, he ever sent you anything? I don't know. Has he been on this show? <laughs> he hasn't been on the show yet. <laughs> I will, uh, And I will only interview uh, John. Uh, Mr. Uh, whatever is he's, whatever he's doing in uh, whatever he's doing in his I don't follow his acting. Um, yeah. I just follow Jim. Well, he's got pretty famous for a little while. He had a good news news show because the news is so bad out there. Oh yeah, he did was news, good news, and it was actually very funny. Um, but and somebody picked it up. I think it was MTV, and I don't I didn't follow it from there on. But uh, and he's been in movies. So yeah. Um, Jim Halpert lives um, in the minds of the TV. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's Jim. We're not going to talk about Jim. We're going to talk about Mark Halpert. He's the, uh, he's the better Halpert because he exists. So, <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> so, uh, so Mark, tell me about your backstory. Since we know that you are not a paper salesman from Scranton, let's talk about what your actual backstory is and, and how we got to where you're at. Backstory. I was a banker. I hated it. I was a corporate finance guy. I hated it. Company got sold. I was happy. I went off on my merry way. And just before the company was sold, I heard about this thing called electronic payments, online credit card processing. And so go back to pre-9-11. This was the wild west of electronic payments. And I was out there pitching this stuff. And then I opened my business and two days later, two giant planes hit two giant buildings and the world came to an end. And for a year, my business went nowhere. Um, just kind of skated along for a little while till 2007. Did okay. Did fine. Happy to be out. Very happy to be on my own. Um, I would never go back to work for somebody else uh, because I never had a boss. Well, I had only one boss who I really respected. The rest are history. And um, decided that in 07, when the economy was down, I needed to meet more people. And how was I going to do that? I had pretty much maxed out my network. I went to all the networking groups and the chambers of commerce, and I was out there and I was running the committees and all this other stuff. I just was skating. I, I, was, I was spinning my wheels. So um, a friend of mine who I met when I first got trained in electronic payments said, hey, this thing called LinkedIn, you ought to look into it. You would love it because you collect people like baseball cards. And I really do. I just collect great people everywhere I go. Uh, and I keep, keep pulling them to the front of the stack. And I keep shuffling the deck a lot and keep everybody going and nurtured and happy. And so I've always done that all my career. 
So he said, you ought to do this. And I tried LinkedIn and I went to a lot of classes on LinkedIn and found out that I knew more than the teachers. And why am I paying these teachers to teach me? That's ridiculous. So I started teaching it myself. I started lecturing on it, I started writing on it. And I figured, hey, there's an encore career for this old guy. I wasn't that old back then. And I, it was just a, a third business, the third leg of the stool that I could use and rely upon when one of the other businesses wasn't doing as well for the month, the other businesses were tugging it along. So LinkedIn became something huge. You know, it's just grown immensely globally with the internet, with everything else that's, that's, that we have access to. And it made what I was teaching that much more important. And that is everywhere you've come from, every experience you've ever had is part of your backstory. Mm-hmm. You're, you're in your pocket, you have skill cards, experience cards, and those cards get pulled out to the front when you need them in the present. And they're always there for you in the future. So past, present, future. And it's all about telling not what do you do, because anybody can do that. I could tell about what you do, and that wouldn't even be a fifth of what I should be talking about. But only you can tell why you do it and why it's important to you. And that's where people really glom on to what makes you interesting because you have the guts, the nerve, the self-reliance, the intelligence to embrace your emotional background and how that feeds your cerebral background. And that's where the two come together. That's branding. The brain and the mind and the heart come together and that's the brand. The story behind the brand is reinforced every use of the brand. And every time somebody uses my program, they reinforce my my brand because I give them the quality they're expecting. So, long answer, but that's why. That's me. No, that's not a long answer at all. I love that answer. So we had this conversation uh, when we met last time, and we were talking about how telling your story, at least for me growing up, it, it is was really def- was really difficult because I was raised in this in this world where you don't talk about yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, you don't talk about yourself and your accomplishments unless somebody asks. Because uh, that's seen as brag- bragging, and so you want to be humble and you know speak of speak uh, speak of others and not of yourself, which was great for a child, <laughs> right? When me growing up and and uh, and being a child, uh, I people enjoyed my company, I hope. And but when I got into the professional world, uh, I remember my first interview and completely bombing it because they asked me all these questions about me and how I saw myself and how I thought why was I the best person for the job. And when somebody asked me that, now I know how to answer it in my uh, my years of knowledge. But uh, with first starting out, it was tough because I didn't know how to appropriately tell somebody else that I'm better than everybody else that they're interviewing because because we we grow up with that sense of don't brag about yourself, don't talk about yourself. So so how does somebody break away from that? Uh, but that thought process and begin to explain themselves digitally and but then just professionally as well to say I'm not bragging but I am telling my story in a way that uh, portrays myself as unique well those interview questions are designed to weed you out against other people how Mm. well or poorly you answer those questions so those are trick questions Mm. tell me about yourself the new question right now is what have you learned? What's been the silver lining in COVID? You know, those types of, you know, ethereal, crazy questions. Then when you get that job, you're just like everybody else. You can't talk about yourself. You can't be you can't be louder. You can't be more brash than the next department because then the department starts fighting. And so that creates in right infighting and all sorts of problems. So I, I was stuck in corporate and I was out there saying, I want to talk about this in public. I'm going to go and teach at the next conference and I want to bring lots of glory and intelligence and eyes to the company. And my bosses kept saying, no, no way. You don't need to do that. You're just trying to get a a trip to Las Vegas or you're going to try to get a trip to Austin or Boston in January. And, you know, no. And um, I kept saying, no, but you don't understand. And they never did understand. Then when I was out on my own, I realized that if I don't talk about me, no one is going to talk about me. And if they do, they're not going to say what I want them to say. So I better start talking about me and what my value proposition is, what my credentials are, what my vision is, what makes a client say, you know, it's between Mark and Roy. Roy's kind of quiet. He's kind of introverted. I don't think he's going to really be there for us when we really need him. That guy, Mark, he seems a little bit more in touch with what what we're looking for. Let's give the Mark guy a try. Sorry, Roy. Didn't work. Maybe next time. And I have clients I've kept for the 19 years I've been in business because I'm there for them. 
Like I was on the phone with some of them last night at 11 o'clock or weekends, or I've been called out of Broadway shows to help a client. But that's the buy-in that I made in becoming an entrepreneur. I'm there for my clients because without them being confident that what I'm doing, then they could go anywhere and I want to keep them sticky all the time. So that's really important to me. So as I developed my craft of knowledge of what I do, I also developed my marketing skills for why I do what I did and being able to express that. Overcoming my parents and teachers and everybody else saying, no, no, don't talk about yourself. We don't care. It's not important. In the world of entrepreneurship, it's important. And there's no better way to talk about why it's important than to weave a story in there mm. because stories are hugely memorable. And I don't know what number storytelling is in the history of careers. There's lots of talk about first career, second career, third career, but it's in the top five. Yeah. So storytelling is really immensely popular and it still works today because we crave intelligent information in a sea of noise. We crave something that makes us believe because we don't know how much fact to absorb or where the facts are even coming from. So when someone creates a story and they're telling their story, their career story in a narrative format using I as a, as a pronoun and a power verb in their LinkedIn profile, we can bring it to what I do, then people are telling really important things. Not just what, but why I do what I do. Why am I committed to why I'm here? And I will do this until the day I die. Don't expect me to retire. Don't expect me to fall away because this is why I live to help my clients exceed their expectations, get them out from under themselves, drag them up by the back of the scruff of their neck and say, come on. I did a, a, there's an elderly man who I just finished coaching who was the vice chairman of his corporation, but he was great about talking about what he did in the corporation. When I asked him to talk about himself, he had no training in that. And so I trained him a little bit to write a great LinkedIn profile. And for him, it was, you know, it was, a, it was epiphany. He had no idea that this was in him. And, he, and then once I got it going, he kept talking about himself and I knew we had broken through and that was great stuff. And I teach a lot of marketing people and communications people. And you think they'd be able to talk about themselves? They can talk about their clients all day long, but they cannot talk about themselves. And it's worse than the shoemaker's children thing. It's that they don't know how to do it. And it's really fascinating. Yeah. So lawyers, baby boomers, you name it, whatever, everybody's got a story. Everybody came from somewhere. Everybody is here for a reason. Everybody has something to share. Your job to share is to share it and be amazing -er than anybody you're competing with. And we're all competing with people all day long. We don't even realize who we compete with. You, so amazing -er is the thing. Do you think that some of that comes from the fact that we don't realize how special some of the things that we do are? Do you think that plays into it at all? Where, um, you know, so oftentimes you talk about finding your next calling or finding your purpose in life. Let's just talk about, but forget finding your next calling, which we're gonna t we're gonna touch on. But finding your calling at all or your purpose is is so oftentimes one of these things that's really hard with people coming out of college. Um, really, at like 17, 16, where we go from okay, you're a kid to okay, what are you doing with the rest of your life? And exactly. that and that switch is is a very hard one to 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 take in because. What do I know at 16? What did, what did I know at, at 25? What do I know at 34? You know, I mean, you're always learning. You don't know. You don't know what you don't know until you're challenged to know it, mm -hmm. to experience it. So my big challenge was right after September 11th. Oh, my God. I left the comfort of corporate life. I knew exactly what I needed to do to get by. I knew exactly what I needed to do to make my bonus. I knew exactly what I needed to do to make the bosses look good because that was my job to make the bosses look good, right? I mean, I'm getting down to the basics here. I don't have a boss. I got to do it. And if I mess up, I can't blame anybody. I got to blame me. And if my client thinks I messed up, I got to make the client understand, yes, I messed up and I admit it or no, I didn't mess up. And here's why this happened to you, us, us, not you, us, right. because we're in it together. So my big finding myself was September 11th. Yeah. I have to make it work. I couldn't face myself. I was going back to corporate. So I made it work and I made it work really well. And then I made it work even better in 07, 08 when I found the tool that I needed to leverage everything I needed to do. But little did I know it was going to be another career. Unfortunately, we don't know 
well, we don't know until it smacks us right in the face, mm -hmm. or we missed it smacking us in the face, and we look back and say, God, I was an idiot. I should have done that then. I could have easily not left corporate, could have found another corporate job, could have hidden out until I was 65 and then retire very cushy, but I'd have nothing to show for it. Mm. And I want to have a business and clients who are happy with me and show it. And that's where I feel I am right now. Yeah. So how, how would we take, I mean, right now we have COVID, right? So that's a, that's a big um, do or die type of type of thing, similar to a 9-11, similar to a Great Recession. I mean, what you've named there are, uh, you know, 9-11 was for, so I was in high school, so I was not in the business world, but I remember it very vividly, and I remember the impact that it had on life. Uh, and then the Great Recession, I was just graduating college, or just leaving college, and had not graduated yet. Uh, wow. wh which, yeah, talk about bad timing and, and, and entering into the world, which I was supposed to leave in 08 and hung around for a little, did a, vic did a victory lap or, or so. <laughs> and, and so for, for that, when you're, when you're talking about, uh, having to do or die, um, how do we tell our story or how do we take that mentality of, I have to survive and do it when there's not a country global crisis going on how do how do we take that those same steps when it's just tuesday okay well first of all let's go back to the crisis you should be marketing your butt off in a crisis yeah most people turn inward and lick their wounds we did a lot of licking of our wounds in a in uh, a one that was really sad that no one was no one would do anything new in fact no one would do anything old we were just like stuck um my father used to say the same thing happened right after uh, Pearl Harbor. This is the country we went inward and then decided that we had to defend ourselves. Well, we had to defend ourselves also, but each of us individually had to decide what we were going to do to get ourselves out of a rut. And you can really dig a terrible deep rut if you let yourself. And the mind digs a very good shovel, uses a shovel very well. It, it just puts all the past behind you. All the ugly stuff just gets torn back up. Well, I decided I was going to market myself like crazy. I had to, you know what? I had to in 07. But in 2020, I said, you know what? I'm not waiting for the pandemic to affect me negatively. It will, and it has. But I am out there meeting every possible person of quality I can meet and impressing upon them that if I can't help them now and they come across somebody who I can help in the future, please do let them know. And I charge a premium price for what I do. I have not reduced my prices because I don't think that's a good business model. Yes, I get it that people are in trouble. Yes, I get it that they can't afford some things. They may not be my market. I've segmented my market to the extent that I want people who can afford the quality I'm providing. There's a wonderful article out there. I think it's in Forbes or it might be Inc. I can't remember. It's called, You Can't Pick My Brain. It Costs Too Much. Mm. And that is, I don't work for lunch. I have a lot of people saying, I'll take you to lunch in New York and you spend an hour and a half, two hours with me going over my LinkedIn profile and you walk away with a full belly and I'll walk away with a full LinkedIn profile. Uh -uh, don't do that. I don't do that. I don't do free. Yeah. Free doesn't put food on the table. Now, I do pro bono work as I decide I want to and it's worthy. So I'll help certain organizations. I'll help certain people. I will cut prices once in a while when I hear an extreme need and it seems like there's something that I can really do to get them out of their own way because I feel like that's an opportunity for me to just be good to them. But um, you've got to figure out how you're going to address the challenge and you have to overcome that challenge. And the challenge is here with us for probably a longer term than we want to expect. So I am marketing my tail off now while my competitors are sitting there just gnashing their teeth figuring out what am I going to do so when we come out of this I'm in a really great position to run with it and they're saying oh my god I should have I should have marketed my tail off when it was really bad but I didn't do that so I've learned my lesson so there's a lot of people who just think that business will knock on their door once the economy comes back around uh that ain't gonna happen yeah yeah that is just a it's a myopic, immature way of looking at how business is done. You have to be in social media, memorable, frequently with highest quality material and innovative, creative ways of pulling together different topics to make it make sense, to be mentioned, to be noticed, to ping on somebody's mental radar screen 
so that when somebody's at a cocktail party and say, hey, I'm looking for a LinkedIn coach. I need to work on my LinkedIn. Do you know anybody? I want to be the name, the face that pops right into their mind. That's what I want. And that takes a lot of time and work and effort and money and experience. So that's my side of the story. I love little stories that make my big story. I like every story I can tell of every job I ever held and every challenge I ever held in that job and how I overcome it with overcame it with either my, by myself or with friends and colleagues, who many of which are my friends for life. I still talk to my colleagues down in Latin America who I worked with 20 years ago. There's a communication. We got each other and we don't ever want to let it go. And yet we've all gone to other things, but we have that story in common. It's like your college alums, your fellow alums. You had that very wonderful experience in college, or you had that wonderful experience working in Goldman Sachs or wherever you worked, Citibank, or whatever it was. There's a culture there. That culture is shared. That becomes part of your fabric. So we have all these little threads, and little threads get pulled together into themes, and the themes get pulled together into the, the, the tapestry of who you are, and the tapestry gets better and better every time you work with it you get amazinger and amazinger as you layer on more and more of your experience. Now, when we're talking about experience and the way that we're laying out this story, I, I've, you've said this to me prior too, but I'd like to rehash it here, is that uh, that your LinkedIn or really your story in general shouldn't read like a resume. And so for, for so oftentimes when we think about who we are and what we've done, we automatically turn to – uh, a Word document, for me at least, and then, you know, maybe a little Clippy, for those of you who are around in the 90s, Clippy pops up in the bottom of, of the, your, your Word document and you click, hey, uh, you're, I see you're writing a resume, you click it, and now you're formatted like everybody else in the world, right? Okay. right? So how do we take our thought process of what we've done and who we are and take it off of that resume? Because, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, man, maybe 20 years ago when I was first starting out, um, my aunt was like, you need to get a resume writer. Somebody needs to go through and write your resume for you so you can tell your story, right? And so that thought process of having to have a resume writer has shifted, it's changed. And now we have these stories that we have to tell about ourselves or our experience. And so how do we shift from thinking about who I am on paper as a resume to who I am in a story that I can portray on LinkedIn or said social, social platform? You take your resume, you take one of these guys, highlighter, and you mm -hmm. highlight themes in your resume. Your resume is factoids, bullet point, verb, past tense, predicate. Do you talk like that? I don't talk like yeah. that. No one talks like that. No one writes like that. It's an archaic, bizarre, formulaic way of taking your entire career and collapsing it onto two fronts of a piece of paper. On LinkedIn, you get as much room as you need. And you can go on and on and on. And mine's seven pages when you print it all out. Hmm. Well, that's a lot more than two. And I haven't had a resume in 25 years. So what you do is you look for themes. You look for themes. You let the resume sit on its own. That's a piece of electronic real estate. If you have it in Word and your Clippy and all that other stuff, you leave it there. And you write your LinkedIn profile. Maybe you take a look here and there for guidance about dates and times and, you know, all those, all the detail stuff. But on LinkedIn, you're writing from your heart and your mind. And when you write from your heart and your mind, you will find it will come across much more real, who you are in your own words. You're not formulaic. You're not stuck within a format that you have to use. You can use all sorts of very rich wording and you play with it and you tweak it and you don't have someone else write it for you, you write it. Now, if you need a coach, I know a great coach yeah. on LinkedIn, he'll teach you, you write it and I'll tweak it with you. So I like to say on LinkedIn, I'm a little bit psychologist and a lot English teacher. All right. A lot of people can't write, save their butts. It's just really sad. So you write it, get it out of your head. I crawl in one ear and I come out the other. You push it all through for me, get it onto LinkedIn, rough format, or put it on a Word document, we'll play with it. And I'll ask you questions about, it. you know, I don't think you ought to say that that way. I think you ought to look at this this way. Now, if there's another thing that you did in your third job that you did in also in your first job and that we tie those together. And I can see things from that 30,000 foot view way up high looking down. You're too close to it because you lived it. Mm -hmm. I'm objective and I can be tough about it, but I want 
you to be embrace it and understand that there are things in your career and in your life you don't even see properly that someone from the outside can see. Biographers write beautiful books because they see things in a historical perspective and in terms of things that we're too close to being ourselves. So there's, it's, it's like writing your manifesto. It's like writing your why. Why did you do this? Why do you do that? Why do you want to do something in your future based upon your past, leading to your present, leading to your future? And it works. It works. I have had very, very few clients who just throw up their hands and say, I can't do it. Hmm. And why can't they do it? Because they don't want to. They're scared. Or worse, like when I was a little kid, my parents said, would you like to take an oil painting class? I said, sure, I'll take an oil painting class. And I went to a class and an older woman was the teacher and she held my hand while the brush was in my hand and she painted from my hand onto the canvas. Now, did I learn anything? Did you learn anything about how to write a resume from your resume writer? Not a bit. Okay. So these are lifelong skills, how to write a resume, how to write a thank you note, recover letter, how to, how to interview, how to use your LinkedIn properly. These are all soft skills. We're not taught these in school. You got to pick them up and you pick them up the hard way. You bounce your head against the wall until you finally figure it out. You make a lot of dumb mistakes, but you look what other people are doing that you respect, that you think have it together, and you take style notes from what they're doing. And you can use that and interpret it through your own lens. And as you get older, you do better. And you see your experience in different ways. So I saw my experience as a banker as an opportunity to perfect my oral presentations. I saw my experience as a corporate guy, as a person who could learn to work with people in all different ways, shapes, and forms, all different uh, backgrounds, and bring everything together into one way, one the corporate way. And then I used all of that. And I taught at the college level for a little while. I perfected my presentation style. And all these things, what I'm doing right now with you these are all things I've worked on all my career because they're those experience cards in my back pocket that I'm pulling out and putting on the table right now. Interesting. So now that we take that information, right, how do we find who we were? That's that information of, of, of what we've done, who we were, and translate that into that what you call an encore career, right? Where somebody who has <laughs> um, been in the government, been in the military, been in name the profession. I named those two because those are very common ones where you do see uh, encore careers. But somebody, how, how first do they know what to, to make of themselves into a, that encore career? What, how do I know what that encore, I have a hard time, I had a hard time finding out what my first calling was. How do I find out what my second calling was? You may have five callings. I've had, I've worked in six different industries and four different careers and I'm not done yet. Um, that's real common these days, especially, well, in the military and in the government, you, you can retire early and take a really nice pension. So your finances are taken care of. You're in good shape. So you can dabble. You can have a little fun. But you always, no matter what you do, whether you have the financial wherewithal or not of a pension or whatever, you always know where your passion was. You always knew what aspects of what job you were happiest with that you preferred to do and put all the others aside as you procrastinated all the stuff you were really supposed to do, but you really didn't want to do. What were those things? For me, it was always helping people rise above where they are right now. I always knew I loved to do it. I probably should have been a teacher early on. I finally found being a teacher in my latter years of my career. And I absolutely love the aha moments I get from people that I work with. So it's whatever it is, you got to really dig deep and you have to be in touch with what makes you happiest and there's tests you can take and assessments you can do and all that but just if you're if you're ready for a new career uh, two people in particular i know they've just sold their businesses they're done they don't want to work a business anymore they want to do something next their biggest fear right now is what do they do when they grow up and they're in their 60s but they're still growing and good for them for not just saying i'm going to play golf for the rest of my life because they have more to offer so one guy in particular who I really think has a lot to offer, he's scared. I can see his knees knocking as he talks about, well, I really don't want to get into something that I really don't find out I really like. Well, how are you going to not know if you like it if you don't try it? How are you going to know? You've got the finances to do it. So go do it. What would you do if you could push that button? How do you answer that question? 
And when I start with my clients, especially the ones that are older looking for an encore career and how we're going to fill out the LinkedIn profile to show the benefit of all the things they've learned and what they want to do next in their encore career. What's the encore? Do you still want to sing? Do you still want to dance? Do you want to sing and dance? Or do you just want to say, chuck it, I want to paint. I just want to do it all, but I want to try it. I want to learn how to play a piano someday. I can't play a piano. I can play two notes and it sounds terrible. I want to, it's the bucket list things that I want to do. I want to learn to speak Spanish. When am I going to learn to do that? I have to make time to and allow myself, give myself permission to try things that I could possibly just fall apart at. Am I going to be a concert pianist? No way. Am I going to be a Spanish speaker in, 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 a, in a, you know, in a very fluent manner? Probably not, but I'm going to give my damnedest try. So it's whatever your passion is, the things you said, I always wanted to do this. And if it's something you can contribute back to society or help people who are in need, great. So a friend of mine, he was CFO of a really large nonprofit in New York City. He retired, mandatory retirement age. He moved to Florida with his wife because that's what everybody was doing. And he called me about three weeks into his new mandatory retirement. He said, I am bored to death. If I play the same golf course one more time, I'm going to go crazy. I said, what are you going to do? He said, I don't know, a CFO and a nonprofit. I think what I'll do is just volunteer at a nonprofit somewhere around here. And then if I see something that needs help, I'll volunteer to help them do that. And I might help them balance their books. I might help them do, do better payroll. But I'll give them the benefit of what I know, but I'm not going to charge for it. I'm going to give them what I know for free. I said, that's noble. That's his encore career. He's just a volunteer. So all these things, I mean, it could go anywhere. I know people who went back to, co went back to grad school, to, mm -hmm. to law school. He was 48 years old. Now, he's twice as old as most of the kids in the law school. But he went back to law school. I know a woman who got her law degree when she was 88. And she was a valedictorian of the law class. So it's possible. You can do that. It's really amazing. You have to want to. You have to not be afraid of failing. Yeah. You have to take an assessment. You have to write it down, keep it in a piece of paper. Some people put it in their wallet for reference so they don't lose it, whatever. Every time you come up with an idea of something, they say, you know, I really love doing this. And how can I make it so it's something that somebody wants me to help them with? So there you go. You're on your way. Nice. Follow your dream. It's dream never too late. Yeah. No. Dream never comes too late. Comes. No. Absolutely. So give me, give everybody one thing where we can say, uh, before, besides call Mark Halpert to help you out with your LinkedIn profile. But what's one thing that somebody listening right now could do to uh, just immediately give them one little bump in, uh, in link on their LinkedIn profile, other than not having it read like a resume, right? Okay. So read your LinkedIn resume, LinkedIn profile, whatever it says, and renovate it. So you're answering why you do what you do. So the outside reader from 30,000 foot view can understand what's in your gut, what's in your heart. And how does that heart attract, uh, connect to your mind? How do all the pieces come together? If you tell me what you did, I'll never know where you want to go unless you know where you want to go. So you got a hint at where you want to go. And no one's holding you to anything on LinkedIn. Yeah, it's got to be factual. Yeah, it's got to be defensible. Yeah, it's got to be beautiful. No typos, no grammar errors. Beautiful narrative of you telling a story as if you're talking to the audience, like I'm talking to you right now. When somebody reads your LinkedIn profile, they should believe you're talking to them directly. But they're talk you're talking about yourself and you're talking about why you do what you do. And then they're apt to make you the competitor in the short list, and then they'll want to call you. They fall in like with you on LinkedIn, they fall in love with you when they call you. Because when they speak to you on the phone, it has to be all that on LinkedIn, plus they're going to go further. They want to hear, there was a back and forth. That's the richness of the conversation that is sub, it's supported by the LinkedIn profile. But really make it easy for the interviewer, make it easy for somebody who you're thinking it might be a good person that you might hire you for a, a gig or a, or a project or whatever. Make it so that they want to know more. They're dying to know more. You held them at the edge of their seat and you're about to give them the punchline. And the punchline is, it's why me? And you know what? This is hard. And it's really, it's, it's just alien to what we're all raised in. But when you get it, you do it in front of a mirror, you do it on a recording, you do whatever you're doing, you do it on a podcast, and you play it back and say, oh, I shouldn't have said that. 
you know what? I said it and I live with it and that's the way it is. And I'm going to go forward in the next podcast or the next few minutes of the same podcast. I'm going to reinforce those same issues. And I have a podcast coming up tomorrow and I'm going to talk about much of the same things, but with just a different filter, a different, it's a different audience. So it might be a military audience or it might be a finance audience. I always just tie it, but it's all the central theme of what makes you who you are today and why you do what you do. And so now that we have learned uh, that tidbit, and like you just said, you want to make somebody else uh, reach out to you, right? So that they can get that punchline and fall in love with you. Well, now that you've given us that tidbit of who you are and how, uh, that punchline and make us reach out to you, how should we reach out to, to you, Mr. Halpert? Best way to reach out to me is to follow me on LinkedIn. I am not going to connect to people I don't know or haven't done business with. That's just my policy. So I will not, if you ask me to connect, I'm going to politely tell you, no, thank you. But I will be happy if you follow me and you'll be able to see all the things I put up on LinkedIn every day. And that's a lot of stuff, a lot of great, I'm told, great stuff. So I'm a thought leader. I do things because I'm thoughtful about it and I want people to benefit from it. So you can find me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash in, I-N, slash Mark, M-A-R-C, Halpert, H-A-L-P-E-R-T. I have a weekday blog, which comes out 8 a.m. every morning. Set your watch to it with a LinkedIn nugget of something that in my life or in somebody else's life who's a guest blog writer, they found a LinkedIn tidbit that they want to pass along. And I've got tons of them. So that blog can be found at connect, the number two, collaborate.com, connect, the number two, collaborate.com, and look for LinkedIn nuggets and sign up, subscribe to my free blog every weekday, 8 a.m. Thank you very much, Mark. I appreciate it, buddy. And uh, thanks for connecting on LinkedIn. I, uh, hey, my pleasure. You're my guy, man. You're the fourth or fifth generation down the chain of people I've met from one guy way up there. Uh, he's a real person, not not the guy up there, but some, one guy up there. I'm realizing I'm, I'm not being clear. But nonetheless, every one of you podcasters seem to want to refer other podcasters to me. And I really appreciate that. So I appreciate you taking a limb, going out on a limb with me on this. Uh, we thank the person that introduced the two of us together. We'll yeah. find other way to people, get people connect to both, both of us through each other. And we'll just make this an ongoing love fest. How do you like that? Yeah, man. It sounds good to me. I appreciate right. you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Well, guys, hopefully you enjoyed that conversation. Go find Mark. I'll put his information in the show notes so that you can go and follow that man, read his blog, get all the goods. Now, guys, if you're looking for more information, more blogs, go on and go to InnovarePodcast.com. You'll be able to find all of our previous interviews and episodes. You can also find us on iTunes. You can find us on Spotify. You can find us on pretty much any podcasting network. We're on nine different networks. And we're on YouTube, so you'll be able to find this video on the good old YouTube of A. So, guys, thanks for following. Go download your mind map at InnovarePodcast.com. And until next time, guys, see ya.